fue de vuestro capitán. Ay, guata. ¿Cómo? ¿Qué fue de vuestro capitán? Ah, Murió. On a late October night in the year 1528, five wooden rafts carried what was left of the Narvaez expedition across the Mississippi River Delta region on their way towards Mexico. It had been over 180 days since they landed in Florida, having dropped anchor in the mouth of Boca Ciega Bay on April 15th and coming ashore at a Tocobaga Indian village at what is now called the Jungle Prada site in St. Petersburg. Against the better judgment of his officers, Panfilo de Narvaez had ordered an army of 300 men and 42 horses to leave the coast and venture inland with him in search of gold. Each man carried only enough food to last about two weeks. They would never see their ships again. Four months later, the land party lay sick and broken on the shore of Apalachee Bay. They were exhausted from forced marches in the Florida sun and constant warfare with the native people. In their desperation, they had decided to kill and eat one of their horses on every third day, and from the skins of the animals they made canteens to carry water for the journey still ahead. Narvaez had settled on a dangerous course of action, instructing his army to build rafts from local materials in which they could escape to New Spain, which he thought was very near. But he had badly underestimated the true size of the Gulf of Mexico, and two months after launching the rafts, they were still at sea. Their horse skin canteens had rotted, and now the soldiers sometimes went four or five days in a row without water. Forty of them had already died by the time they reached the Mississippi River. Those that were still alive were too weak to fight the current, and so the rafts drifted out to sea and were separated. Only four men out of the 300 in the land party would live to tell the story of the Narvaez expedition. One of them, an officer named Cabeza de Vaca, would eventually return to Spain and write down what happened. He said that the last time he saw the governor, Panfilo de Narvaez, his captain rejected a request to lash their barges together, renounced his authority as adelantado, denied responsibility for the lives under his command, and declared the end of Spain itself. When we learn about the Narvaez expedition in school, that's all we get. Narvaez came to Florida, made some mistakes, abandoned his men, and died at sea. But in this video, we'll go much deeper into who Panfilo de Narvaez was, actually. Where did he come from? How did he lose his left eye? And why was he named the governor for life of Florida in 1526? Before we begin though, let's take a moment to discuss how to properly pronounce Panfilo de Narvaez's name. The most common mistake is to add an extra R to his last name to make it three syllables. Narvarez. Not to pick on him too much, but here's our District 1 representative, Robert Blackman, adding the extra R. I'm Robert Blackman, your council member for District 1, an area rich in history that has played a vital role in the shaping of our city. Dating all the way back to the 1500s with the landing of Spanish explorer Panfilo de Navarrez. In his defense, getting it wrong on this street sign is even worse. You just can't go around adding extra letters to people's last names. 15th century Castilian Spanish can be a little tricky, but the name Narvaez is understood to have two syllables, and it might help us English speakers to break it down into the sounds narv and eyes. Sue Anderson is a narrator for LibriVox.org, and she does a really nice job saying it. Take it away, Sue. The governor, Panfilo de Narvaez. Panfilo de Narvaez was born in Castile, Spain, probably in the city of Valladolid in the year 1478. The Kingdom of Castile gets its name from the huge number of impressive castles built there during the Middle Ages, and the city of Valladolid was its capital. It was the city where Ferdinand and Isabella were married, uniting Spain, and where Christopher Columbus passed away in the year 1506. Panfilo de Narvaez was a close relative of Diego Velazquez de Cuellar, a man who would become the first Spanish governor of Cuba. Velazquez and Narvaez were also friends with Bishop Juan Rodriguez de Fonseca, 
the Catholic Bishop of Burgos, who would later become Spain's de facto Minister of Colonial Affairs when King Carlos I, a.k.a. Charles V, became the Holy Roman Emperor. Bishop Fonseca would also later prove instrumental in getting Narvaez his royal appointment to conquer and colonize Florida. We don't know who Narvaez's parents were, but he did come from a noble family and would have been considered a Hidalgo. You've probably heard the word Hidalgo before, maybe in a movie, but what it actually means is a class of Spanish noblemen who lacks a hereditary title and who often owns little land. The word Hidalgo is just a shortened form of the Spanish phrase hijo de algo, which literally translates as son of something. Hidalgos got to enjoy all the social privileges of the upper class, but without necessarily being rich. They were exempt from paying taxes, but it didn't matter since most of them didn't own much to tax. Hidalgos could, however, start out as officers in the military. For that reason, Panfilo de Narvaez enrolled in military service when he was a youth. During the European Age of Discovery kicked off by Columbus in 1492, Hidalgos had been some of the first and most eager to enlist as officers on voyages to the New World. Their goal was usually to acquire wealth and property in the form of large encomiendas, plantations with enslaved people provided by the government from the native population. Narvaez first came to Jamaica in 1509, the same year the first permanent European settlement, called New Seville, was founded on that island to help establish and enforce the encomienda system. Narvaez had already spent years learning military tactics, and the young commander was described as, quote, a man of authoritative personality, tall of body, somewhat blonde and inclined to redness. Famous American historian William H. Prescott described Narvaez as a man of some military capacity, but negligent and lax in discipline. Quote, He possessed undoubted courage, but it was mingled with an arrogance which made him deaf to the suggestions of others more sagacious than himself. End quote. That arrogance and inability to admit mistakes would haunt Narvaez, biting him again and again throughout his career. In 1511, two years after arriving in Jamaica, Panfilo de Narvaez was recruited to lead a division of the army under his relative Diego Velazquez. Velazquez had just been given permission by Spain's King Ferdinand to conquer and govern the nearby island of Cuba. His lieutenant Narvaez would be greeted by stiff resistance from the island's native Taino people. Several Taino caciques would lead a guerrilla campaign against the Spanish that lasted for years. Embedded with Narvaez's army in Cuba was a priest named Bartolome de las Casas, the first priest to ever be ordained in the New World. Las Casas wrote about several atrocities he witnessed as the Spaniards swept across the island. The worst came at a place called Cao Nao near Camaway. According to Las Casas' account, 2,000 Taino villagers from the countryside had traveled there to greet the Spanish with loaves of bread and fish. As the food was being distributed among the soldiers, one conquistador, in whom Las Casas writes, quote, the devil is thought to have clothed himself, drew his sword, and soon the Spanish were massacring the entire peaceful gathering. Las Casas says he was running around frantically trying to stop the killing when Panfilo de Narvaez rode up on his horse and said proudly, how does your honor like what these our Spaniards have done today? To which Las Casas replied, that I command you and them to the devil. In his book, The History of the Indies, Bartolome de las Casas sums up the Cuban campaign by saying, quote, I saw here cruelty on a scale no living being has ever seen or expects to see, end quote. In 1513, King Ferdinand issued a decree establishing the encomienda land system in Cuba. Velazquez was made the adelantado, or governor, and he was responsible for dividing up the land and apportioning the newly enslaved indigenous people to the new landowners. His relative Narvaez would be given a large encomienda and many enslaved workers, and Narvaez would continue to be a decided favorite of Velazquez for years to come. That's it for this video, guys. Panfilo de Narvaez would continue to live in Cuba for most of the next decade until his relative, the governor Velazquez, called upon him once again in 1520 to lead an army. This time, it was the second largest fleet ever assembled in the New World, 
and Narvaez was sent to Mexico to extract Velazquez's rogue commander, Hernan Cortez, who was running amok in the capital of the Aztecs. Uh, Mexico did not go well for Narvaez. That's where he actually lost his eye. And we're gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you the full story of what happened next time. Uh, we decided to break this series up into three parts. So you just watched the first, which covers the background of Panfilo de Narvaez through his time in Jamaica and Cuba. In part two, we'll see what happened to him in Mexico. And finally, part three is the part that I'm looking forward to talking about the most. That's the 1528 Narvaez expedition to Florida. In the meantime, please like and subscribe to this channel. And if you'd like to take a tour of the Florida landing site of Panfilo de Narvaez, visit www.discoverfloridatours.com and give us a call or drop us an email. We actually are scheduling private tours of the landing site, which also includes a 900-year-old Tokabaga Indian mound and a really nice garden full of peacocks. We'll get back to you with part two of who was Panfilo de Narvaez actually. See ya.